Ladies and gentlemen, have any of you ever come across a video out there on the internet that you stared at with fascination? Something you couldn't understand how it was humanly possible. I'm talking about an expert in their craft, like a woodworking project, a glass blower. Those videos of extreme athletes that ride a bicycle down the side of a mountain and then do like three flips in the air. Now, what I'm going to show you today is equally as exciting, and that is a game of chess. Specifically, we're going to be covering how Magnus Carlsen is able to defeat players with decades of expertise at the highest level, and he's able to defeat them in a way that you simply sit back and go, I don't get it. This is breathtaking stuff. Now, I am in the middle of a 24-hour uh, uh, fast. So if I say anything in this video that's loopy or dopey, beyond my usual idiocy, uh, please forgive me. I ate a ton of uh, junk food this weekend and I wanted to do a, uh, a bodily uh, purge. I'm not a nutritional expert. I am simply a chess YouTuber just because I'm doing it. Does not mean any of this is medical advice. I'm testing out my own uh, mostly mental limitations uh, because, you know, uh, a lot of us, like, we just sit around. We want to eat something. We want to snack. We want to drink something. So uh, testing it out. And I'm, uh, I'm, t I'm 20 hours in, so I've got a few hours to go. I'm going to break some fast later with, this, with some soup. Some uh, poultry, some, you know, some vegetables. going to be great. Not that you asked, but, uh, you know, like I said, you're here now. Anyway, Magnus Carlsen versus Vishwanathan Anand is the matchup. Vishy, legend of the game. This game was played in the Global Chess League, uh, which was an online... Uh, sorry, uh, I mean, it was covered online. It was an in-person um, chess event held in London. So Magnus opens the game with the English opening. And Anand plays c5. When you have an opponent who plays the symmetrical against you, the symmetrical English is one of the most annoying because the opponent is basically saying, you, you do something stupid first. All right, you create an imbalance first, you take a risk first. Magnus plays knight f3, we have knight f6, knight c3, knight c6, and clearly Vichy Anand is employing uh, the notorious copycat variation. If you ever play against somebody and you want to really annoy them, this is what you have to play. And the copycat variation is so ridiculous that black could actually copy white, like, the entire game. Like, I'm not exaggerating when I say, quite literally, the entire game. Like, this could become the position. Th this is actually a real thing. Uh, but Magnus breaks the imbalance early, and he plays d4. So now Anand can't really copy. He can, actually. It's not completely stupid. But then Magnus will go here, and this is no longer anything uh, where black can copy. So d4, cd4, knight d4. Now black plays this move e6. This is cutting edge stuff. Black wants to put the bishop on before targeting white's knight and disallowing white from easy central play. And this position has been explored a bunch in recent days and recent times. g3, bishop c5 is, is generally what black plays. Black goes here. Black sometimes will, you know, damage the structure. Whatever. That's the idea. e6. And now, rather than playing g3, which I believe, according to the database, is the most common move, it is. And then, after g3, the second most common move is a3, preventing bishop b4. Magnus plays e4, which is a, re which is a normal move. Although now, you're kind of in a Sicilian defense, which is sort of interesting. A Sicilian defense which can arise from e4, c5, knight f3, right? e6 d4 takes, knight takes d4, and now black is playing a Taimanov, and here white plays this move c4. Now black plays knight f6, and white plays knight c3. Actually, what's funny about knight f6 is that this is called the Kramnik variation. I'm not even exaggerating, it is called the Kramnik variation of the Sicilian defense. Hilarious. Uh, but, uh, and if you don't know who Kramnik is, don't worry, it's kind of a chess inside joke at this point, but you should look him up. Uh, fascinating, you know, uh, career uh, of, a, of, of, a, of a top chess legend and now turned into whatever it is now. Anyway, e4. It should be 4. Now white takes on c6, so black loses flexibility in the position and plays bishop d3 so that the knight cannot be taken. The center is defended. Black plays this move e5 because if black castled, 
there's a chance white would go for e5. So e5. And now Magnus plays castles. Black plays bishop, uh, sorry, castles. And here you have the first moment, right? Here, historically, white plays bishop e3, bishop g5, queen c2, queen e2, and sometimes f4. What white does not play is h3. That's a weird move. That move stops something going to g4, but that's about it. Also, black's setup is such that black would like to take on c3 next. There's a reason black doesn't take on c3 in this position. You can, but uh, then white can play c5. This is the problem. And now black is going to struggle. If black plays queen a5, white plays a4, you can't really take because bishop a3. And if you take this pawn, actually white is better here. It's very difficult for black to make any moves. Which is why castling and h3 doesn't really make any sense, because black is now going to take and play d6, which stops white from playing c5. That is the entire point. Magnus has messed up the opening. No. This is step one of Magnus doing Magnus things. He always plays games in this type of fashion. He plays in a way that takes the opponent away from traditional opening theory. Remember... Black just played in a way which allows white to play c5. I just showed that to you. Well, black's entire setup here is designed to stop white from playing c5. If white now plays bishop e3, black might even play c5. And white's pawn structure is horrendous. Black will spend the rest of the game hammering away at the pawn. Well, then it's all the more fitting that in this position, Magnus introduces the move c5 himself. Now, he is not the first person to play this move. This move was played some years ago uh, by some players. Some decent players. Um, in particular, in what's called the Correspondence Database, which is basically nerds with computers who have unlimited time to make a move. You ever play daily chess on chess.com? You got 24 hours, 7 days. There used to be a thing back in the day called Correspondence Chess where you would mail each other moves. It was adorable. You would have to analyze it with your own brain. Sometimes with the help of a friend. I don't actually know if that's the rule. That's actually adorable, because you would, you know, you would have seven days to think about a position back when engines knew nothing. Now a TV can defeat you. An app on a TV. I lost to a treadmill once. Correspondence chess in the modern era is who uses the engine more effectively. And the engine has been used in this position. One game ever went queen c2, but Magnus here plays f4. So this is typical Magnus stuff. He plays in a different way in an opening, and he creates a unique position. He is straight up just down a pawn. You may be wondering, why can the pawn not just be taken? Well, black now has doubled C pawns, which white can hammer away for the rest of the game. Black's inherent advantage is the doubling of the C pawn on the C file. It's not particularly great. The center is destabilized, which is why Magnus attacks it right away. If Anand takes bishop f4, I mean, white can get e5, white can play queen f3, white can play rook d1, and I think white is going to start an attack. That, that, this, is, this is what white is going to try to do in this position. Which is why after f4, Vichy's like, you know what, I'm going to give him the pawn back. Take the pawn. After you take, we're going to trade queens. You lose control of the center. No. c4, Magnus, down a pawn, steps out of the center of the board, and they trade... And they trade again, and now bishop e6. And the craziest part about this position, this position where Magnus gave up a pawn, and traded queens, and traded knights, and he only has two rooks and two bishops, he's better. It breaks the principles of everything you're taught. We teach you, don't lose pawns like that in the opening, right? We just teach you, like, why would you lose a pawn? Don't lose a pawn. Right? Then we teach you, if you lose material, don't trade. Trading is bad when you're down material. But then we do this. Yeah. And now watch as Magnus utilizes the bishop pair. The fact that he controls the dark squares better than his opponent because he has a dark squared bishop. The fact that he has open files and the fact that there are two weaknesses. And the fact that his king has further, uh, closer access to the center, which is important in the endgame. Watch the maestro go to work. Rook b1. Open file. And the fact that black cannot go to the b-file to make a trade. Now I have access whenever I want. Vichy plays h6. He spends a minute and a half on this move, because frankly, it's not easy to make a move here. Now Magnus again makes an improvement. 
An improvement that doesn't make sense to an amateur at home. A4. Why is this a good move? Wouldn't the bishop have been better so I could... No. The point is that the pawn goes up there and will serve as an anchor for the rook in the future. Furthermore, this pawn is now out of the way of any bit, just in case, right? It's just an innocent, improving move. And if black does nothing, this is a monster improvement of white's position. Monstrous improvement. Because like I said, the rook now has an anchor and forever pressures the position. So that's why Anand plays a5. But Magnus knows that inducing this very simple and straightforward pawn move that disallows white to have access further down the A-file will potentially create a weakness in the long run. That bishop, right, will potentially go to C7. Also, you now have access to B6. You, don't, you didn't have access before. Well, we're not going to go to B6 yet. We're going to go to B7. Vichy plays knight H5. Forcing Magnus, is he going to stay on this diagonal or is he going to go this way? Also, maybe potentially looking for F5. In the future, Bishop goes back to e3. Now Vichy plays g5. Now we see the point. Vichy is trying to play logically. He played h6. He played g5 and knight h5. He's obviously looking for knight f4. Simple idea of which is now white does not have a bishop pair. Right? That's the point. Knight h5. Vichy's not going to go down without a fight. By the way, all of that happens. Literally everything that I just showed you. Magnus uses this moment to play king f2. He could have played rook d6. But king f2... It's a rapid game also. Remember, the boys have less than 10 minutes on the clock. Like, you give them 70, they're probably going to figure something else out. Knight f4, this is painfully practical decision-making. Vichy does everything. He plays h6, knight h5, g5, knight He makes a multi-step plan, and Magnus just gets rid of... Hold up. What? But didn't I just say you don't want to lose the bishop pair? Yes. Yes. I did just say that. However... Magnus gives up one of his advantages because one of the things that he has is the foresight to think, you know, traditional advantage. Like, he, does, he bends every rule. We just told you, don't lose a pawn, don't trade pieces. He did that. I tell you, don't trade the bishop for the knight. He can do it. He loses the bishop pair. Why? Pawn islands. Black now, ha well, Black now has one of the worst pawn structures ever, right? Like, he has... Four sets of islands, despite having seven pawns. He has doubled isolated pawns, doubled isolated pawns, and not through any fault of its own. Uh, of his own, I mean, for Anand, like, okay, I guess it is. Like, it, it's his fault he moved the pieces to those squares. But what I'm saying is he hasn't done anything ridiculously bad. The position is equal. The engine thinks it's equal. How do you defend this position, though? Because I am, I am just moments away from eating every pawn you have. And then I'm going to get my king into the game, which is also very important. Rook d8. Magnus now has this move, rook a7, which is really gnarly. Which is trying to take and infiltrate. But he, he plays rook d1 here. With the intention that if Anand takes, like he does in the game, I take back and I get in on the d-file anyway. Now, Vichy, not going to go down without a fight, despite only having six minutes on the clock. Plays the move rook b8. He's got to activate his own rook. Magnus takes the pawn. Now, Magnus is no longer down a pawn, and Black still has five problematic pawns. All right? Best move by Vichy. And this is what I love, right? Like, he's going to fight back. He gets the rook to the second rank. It's the best spot. Rook c1. Do you know how many human beings in this position would autopilot rook d2? I mean, you keep control of the file. Rook c1, again, if I had a student who played rook c1, I would yell at the student. Because I'm like, why are you putting the rook behind three pawns, three pieces? What is the rook possibly going to do there? It's like Princess and the Pea. The rook's presence is not felt. But when Magnus plays it, I'm like, oh, I got to pay attention. I wonder why he did that. Why did he... I wonder what the idea is. King f8. Magnus plays king e5. And now the king is getting closer, right? So th this is exactly why the king proximity to the center of the board. King d6 is a mistake. What black should play here is king d7, anticipating white's arrival, and then maybe king c7. But this very innocent move, king d6, allows e5 check, which we saw, king e7, and now g4. And again, the engine for this endgame is going to say it's equal. And I'm not going to tell you when the advantage goes the other way. I'm not going to tell you. We're just going to watch. What Magnus has the opportunity to create here is an outside pass pawn. He can trade, 
and create a pass pawn. He can trade, try to create an outside pass pawn. Bishop d5, h4. Vichy anticipates that side of the board. He plays king f8. Magnus king c5. But now black has to worry about this. He has to worry about this. He has to worry about everything weak. And the rook, while it is doing a decent job, is stuck. It's, it's going to have a difficult, difficult time moving. You know why Magnus played rook c1, by the way? Because he knew that when all of this was going on, at some point the center would open and black would pin. And this is really sick because... Here, if the rook was on d2, black would play bishop e4 and win the game because of the pin. King g7, king d6. Just makes improvements. Rook a2, g5. Takes, takes. Okay, but how is Magnus going to break through here? Bishop f5. We see the other reason why the rook needed to be on c1. Because at the right moment, the bishop would dart away. But the a4 pawn is hanging. Yes, but the c pawn is not hanging. It doesn't matter if you lose the a4 pawn, because Magnus is going to play g6, fg6, and rook g1. And there is a famous clip of Garry Kasparov. Famous clip of Garry Kasparov. You can look it up after you finish this video, where he says, Magnus is a lethal combination of Anatoly Karpov and Bobby Fischer. And what he said about, and this game is the a personification of that quote. In that quote, what Gary means is that Anatoly Karpov was able to maximize the utility of every piece. And as we see here, he's doing that. He's maximized the utility. The bishop, the rook, the pawn, all promote, like pushing down. But Fisher would fight to the very last remaining pawn. And that is what Magnus is doing. He's going to lose every... He lost the whole... Si he lost these two pawns, this pawn, and this pawn. But he's keeping one remaining. And that pawn is the difference maker. That pawn wins the game for white. Because you get rook g6. King goes here. You play rook f6. King goes here. How do you win? Like this. It's not about running the pawn for... It's not about coming here. It's not about e6. That might win too. But if you lose all your pawns, that's not going to be the difference maker. So king g7, king e7, parting ways with the c pawn. But the point is, if you take it, rook g6 check. If you go king h7, I have a discovered attack and I win the rook. And if you go to h8, I go king f8. And this is mate. Now you could stop mate, but I'm going to take your rook. So king e7 and suddenly Anand is like, wait a minute. It's not about the pawn at all. It's about my king. So I need to protect my king, and I have to, I have to create counterplay. Rook g6 check, king h8, and now e6. And the crazy thing is, if, if, if chess was as simple as this, rook versus rook and bishop, right? Rook versus rook, that's a draw. But you're mated. You're mated. Your king did not survive. I'm threatening two different checkmates, and you cannot stop both. Somehow, Magnus, from this position had the foresight to realize the king will get in, the pawns will get in, and I'm either going to promote my pawn or use it as a defensive shield and then go get the king, which is going to be stuck in the corner. Now, obviously, he didn't think of that on the fly. He didn't think of that when the game started. That's not what I'm saying. But he maximized the utility of every piece, and he fought down to the final pawn. And, and I mean, I just... Again, I'm, I wasn't going to tell you where the game even got out of... Like, how did, how did Vichy even make a mistake? King e7, I'll show you the last few moves. Rook b3, rook g6, e6. Taking doesn't do anything, right? I just showed you. Even, even king takes and king f7. Kar uh, 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 Anand is three squares... I almost called him Karpov. He's three squares away from queening. But king f6, a3. Rook h6 forces the king here. Bishop h7, king h8. Check, king g8, and bishop f7. And here Vichy Anand resigned. Because he's about to get checkmated, not even with the rook, but also with the pawn. The, the, I told you that pawn was the difference maker. So we go back. Where on earth in this endgame? And this is the problem. Honestly, this is the problem. Like, sports need a scoreboard. Right? 
you need a scoreboard because you walk into a loud place, you see the scoreboard, you're like, oh, my, team, my, my team's up 24-20. In chess, having this, it takes away from the intelligence of some of the moves. Because you watch this game, you go, well, it's equal. I mean, the, why is the end game so brilliant? The end game's brilliant because practically it is a nightmare. And the, the losing move for Anand was the absolutely innocent King G7 anticipating the expansion over here. And King D6, Rook A2, normal, G5, pawn takes, pawn takes, Rook A3, attacking Magnus's pawn was a mistake. Anand here had to go back to where he was and just admit that his position is bad. And if G6, FG, you stop Rook G1. That's the idea. And if E6, again, it, it, it looks like it's just winning. King F67, I mean, it's completely winning for white. The only move is G5. And it's still not even clear why that's the only move. The point is after E7, Bishop F7, King D7, Rook B7, and you stop the king. That's the point. The Rook had to be on B2. Anand made the same mistake that so many people historically have made against Magnus. He took his eye off the ball for one second. He put his rook on a slightly more passive square on a3. Magnus went bishop f5, g6, and rook g1. Parted with everything, fully invested in this, and used a, sh a peace shield against the rook to get back in the game, forced the king to the corner, and checkmates the king with a pawn. King f8, e7. Just masterful. I mean, again, this is... When Magnus wins a game, there's like three bullet points. Number one, opening wrinkle. And, and his brain is wrinkled too, which is a good thing. Smooth is not good. Castles, and he plays h3, gives this up, and sacrifices this pawn. This is the opening wrinkle. Then what he does is he puts practical pressure on the opponent. Plays moves like a4 to get them to play a5, right? And then, again, it's just, it's purely practical. Like, practically, this position is so hard to play with black. He breaks principles. But he's able to get away with it because they're rooted in decent fundamentals anyway. And then it's the stamina. I mean, it is the fact that he can ask questions and questions and questions and questions. And he keeps asking questions and he keeps asking questions. And not like, you know, uh, somebody who watches too many podcasts asks questions. But like a person who, you know, plays a lot of really, really good chess moves asks questions. And before you know it, your king is suffocated in the corner of the board and getting checkmated by a pawn. Just a fantastic game. Just an excellent game. I love games like this. And, you know, recently he's been playing a lot of stuff. Like, I, I, was, I was so bored of the, of the symmetrical English. And now Magnus played a game and I'm like, I'm going to go take a look at D4. Maybe there's some life here after all. Anyway, um, really just awesome stuff. And um, that's all I have for you today. Enjoy. And if you're watching this in October of 2024, uh, I'll be heading to Stockholm, Sweden pretty soon to play Pia Kramling in a chess match. And tickets for the fan event will come out officially tomorrow. Some of you already started uh, getting those tickets. We want to make the webpage a little bit better. It's not completely clear what's going on. So that's all I have. Get out of here.